Okay, um, thanks for coming. So, um, as I announced last time, the uh, main application today, which will basically feature all the ingredients that we had in the previous lectures, will be uh, a moment estimate for L functions. And in order to prepare for this, I would like to recall state's formula that we had last time, or perhaps uh, in the second lecture, I guess. So this is one of the few, um, few analytic results that we have on higher rank Whittaker functions. If I take the Whittaker function attached to the index alpha, and I multiply it by the Whittaker function attached to the index beta, times the determinant of y to the power s and the Haar measure on the group A, then this is the product of gamma functions that you would expect from Rankine-Selberg theory. It's the product jk from 1 to n, gamma r s plus i alpha j minus beta bar k. And this has to be taken with a grain of salt. And I, I'm not sure if the bars are all correct, but morally speaking, this should be OK divided by gamma r of ns times the product 1 less than j strictly less than k less or equal than n, gamma r of 1 plus i alpha j minus alpha k times gamma r 1 plus i beta j minus beta k, everything barred. OK. Um, so we will use this a million times today. And um, what I would like to introduce now is Rankine-Selberg theory for GLN. And this is also one of the things, one of the few things that works exactly as in the GL2 case. So for general n, we consider the maximal degenerate Eisenstein series. E of z comma s. I defined this in the case n equals 3, and in the general case, it, it's exactly the same thing. It's the sum over gamma modulo the maximal parabolic subgroup, determinant gamma z to the power s, and p is the maximal parabolic subgroup. And with this definition, the same unfolding works as in the GL2 case. So if we consider the inner product of f times g bar against an Eisenstein series, this Eisenstein series, then this is by definition the integral of h modulo gamma f g bar e of dot comma s d mu uh, bar bar and now we can do the usual unfolding um, this is a sum over gamma mod p and this is an integral over h mod gamma and by gamma invariance we can unfold this to an integral of h mod p f of z g bar of z determinant of z to the power s d mu of z and at this point I insert the Fourier expansion for one of these factors say the first one. And you remember the Fourier expansion was a little complicated. It had a sum over a lower rank group outside, SLN minus 1, 
modulo the unipotent subgroup. And here again, we can collapse integral and sum. And um, this becomes an integral over h mod the unipotent uh, subgroup of dimension n. And then sum over the, the m's. These are the indices of the Fourier coefficients. Am, so this is a vector. Uh, divided by the normalization product, mj to the power j times n minus j over 2, times the Whittaker function, times the exponential, where these xj's are the first off-diagonal. So this is the Fourier expansion, and this additional sum is collapsed with the integral, and then I just copy the rest. And at this point, I can execute the integral over x and insert. So if I integrate this over x, then by definition, I just get back the Fourier expansion, so the Fourier coefficients of g. So I perform the x integration. That's g of z, right? Uh, yes. I haven't yet performed the integration over, over x. That's now to come. So I integrate over x. And then I'm left uh, only with the integral over a. So this is the y integration. It's the, it's the subgroup a. And what is left, so Everything is killed by orthogonality of characters, except, so b are the Fourier coefficients of g, divided by the normalizing product. And now the over 2 disappears, because I get it twice for, from a and b. And I get a Whittaker function attached to the form f, and a Whittaker function attached to the form g. So recall m was the diagonal matrix having the m's and products thereof as entries. The x doesn't contribute to the determinant, so only the y contributes to the determinant. And this is the Haar measure on the group A. OK, and here we are in good shape. Uh, we can do a change of variables to remove this m. And then what we are left with is essentially the integral over two Whittaker functions. And this is precisely where state's formula is used. So this equals the rankin selberg L function of f times g bar at s divided by zeta of ns times the gamma ratio that com comes from state's formula. Where the rankin selberg L function is defined as follows. It's by definition, zeta of ns. This is needed to have a nice Euler product. And then you divide by zeta of ns here. Um, as in the usual case, you, divide, you multiply by zeta of 2s for the rankin selberg l function in order to get a nice Euler product. And then am bm bar divided by m1 to the power n minus 1, and then all the way to mn minus 1 to the power 1 to the power s. So the, the last coordinate comes with power 1, and then the other coordinates come with higher powers. OK, so group theoretically, this, uh, this unfolding is slightly more complicated. But in principle, it's the exact same idea, and it gives the exact same result.
Okay, so rankin selberg is very robust. It uh, works for general n. So in particular, uh, this Eisenstein series has a, um, uh, has a pole at s equals 1 with constant residue. And so if I take the residue of this as s, e s, uh, s equals 1 and then take f equals g, then I just get the, the Peterson norm of f. Since the residue at s equals 1 of the Eisenstein series is constant, we have that the Peterson norm is roughly the residue s equals 1 L of f times f bar at 1. times, okay, so times, okay, so maybe I should, times the gamma factors, so maybe I should write this. So this is the completed L function in my notation, and the completed L function includes the appropriate gamma factors. Yes. Yes. Okay. Any questions? OK, so then let's move on to the application. Example, moments of L functions. So this has now a real analytic number theory flavor on GLN. And this is based on a paper of mine that was published perhaps two years ago. So as a warm up, let's do the case n equals 2. That's the case we are all familiar with. OK, and I want to prove the following theorem. Take a classical holomorphic cusp form of weight k and say full level. And then we look at the following second moment. We sum over a basis of cusp forms uh, of this space. So bk is a basis of sk. The rankin selberg L function, L one half, F times G, and it doesn't matter whether I put a bar here or not, because in level one everything is real, uh, except uh, so certainly if we restrict to Hecker eigenforms. Uh, okay, and so this sum has k terms roughly, and on Lindelof we would assume that the whole thing is of size k, and this is what the theorem says there is a bound of size k to the 1 plus epsilon. So this is as strong as Lindelof on average, and it's on the edge of subconvexity. The subcon so the, the, the convexity estimate is square root of k. And um, if I drop all but one term, then I just get square root of k. Um, yeah, so it's on the edge of subconvexity and it's Lindelof on average. OK, so how, how would you prove this? Well, if you are trained as a classical analytic number theorist, then the first thing you do in this situation is you write down an approximate functional equation, open the square, and perform the sum over g using the Peterson formula. Um, if you do this, then the following happens. Approximate functional equation, 
plus Peterson formula. This leads to a double sum coming from the square. You open the square, so you get sum over n and m. Both are roughly of size k. And you have lambda f of n, lambda f of m. And then there is a sum over c coming from the, from the Peterson formula. It turns out that the sum over c is essentially bounded. So let me um, just choose c to be 1, so that the closed term and sum vanishes, and only the Bessel function survives. And you get something like this. Oh, well, no, 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 it equals one. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, it, it vanishes from the formula. That's what I meant. It disappears because, yeah, so it's one. Yes. Um, so this is the beast you would have to estimate uh, of size k. You have two sums of length k, so square root cancellation would give you the desired bound k. But if you look at this, it doesn't look very nice because both variables are of size k, so the argument is of size k and the index is of size k, so you're in the tra transitional range of Bessel If you know something about Bessel functions, if the argument is the same as the index, that's a disaster. Um, so probably you can push this through if you're, if you're a good analytic number theorist, but that's probably very hard. So it's probably hard. Instead, I would like to use a very different approach. And, and in, in, in addition, this approach would never work in higher rank. Um, so I use a very different approach. Um, so instead, we do the following. So to fix notation, uh, let me remove the f here. Uh, it's just lambda n times n to the k minus 1 over 2 times e of nz. And I define the L infinity factor of f times g. That's the usual infinity factor that you get in Rankine-Selberg. It's gamma of s over pi to the s times gamma of s plus k minus 1 over 4 pi to the s plus k minus 1. And as you can see, this doesn't depend on f and g. It only depends on the common weight. So, and the weight is something that we don't change during the argument, so let me just denote this by L infinity of s. And then we have seen before, in much, in much greater generality, that uh, the square of the two norm is, well, it's essentially L infinity of 1 times the finite L function, but it turns out that the residue of the finite L function is bounded above and below. So it's of size k to the power plus minus epsilon. This is my shorthand notation for an upper and lower bound at the same time. It's bounded above by k to the epsilon and bounded below by k to the minus epsilon. OK. And now let's run the following argument. So we are interested in the sum over g, l 1 half f times g squared. OK, the first thing we do is we work with the completed L function, because the completed L function is easier to handle than the, the finite part of the, of the L function. So this is sum over g, lambda 1 half f times g squared divided by L infinity of 1 half squared. OK, so far I haven't done anything. OK. So I need this blackboard here to keep track of what we are doing. So here comes the first step. Um, I use Rankine-Selberg to write this as an inner product. So this is 1 over L infinity at 1 half squared times sum over G, inner product of F, uh, OK, here I write it different. It doesn't matter. Fg times E dot comma 1 half. 
right? That's Rankin-Selberg unfolding. It's okay. Um, yes. So this is step one, and one is Rankin-Selberg. Okay. In order to prepare for spectral analysis, I would like to have a sum. So this is a sum over Hecker eigenforms, but I would like to have an L2 normalized version of this. So I would like to have G to be L2 normalized. So I artificially L2 normalize it. Get L infinity one half squared times sum over G in a product FG E of dot comma one half squared. And now I divide by the two norm of G squared. And to compensate for this, we know what the two norm squared is. It's essentially L infinity at one up to a small error term. So let me write K to the O of one here so that this equality is really an upper and lower bound. OK, so what do we need for this step? Two is, again, Rankin-Selberg, plus we need good upper bounds for the residue uh, at s equals 1. So upper bound for the residue at s equals 1, L of f times f bar s. OK. Now, this looks very much like uh, applying Parseval. I move this out of the sum. So then I get k to the little o of 1, l infinity at 1, l infinity at 1 half squared. And by Parseval, well, maybe it's Bessel's inequality. Um, this is this thing here, squared, f times e at 1 half, right? So this sum is the spectral expansion of this square here. OK, so at this point, it's not really clear how to cont I mean, a nice thing would be to apply Cauchy-Schwarz at this point. Unfortunately, Cauchy-Schwarz is not easily available. I mean, I, I would like to estimate this by the 2 norm of f times the 2 norm of, of e, but the, the 2 norm of e doesn't exist. So I cannot easily apply Cauchy-Schwarz. But I, I have something, well, we can do something similar, and I will explain this later. This is a sort of regularization. So this is step 4. 4 needs some regularities. So that, this was 3. So 3 is Parseval. Four is some regularization that I will explain in a moment. It turns out that this is bounded by k to the little o of 1 divided by L1 half squared and L infinity at 1 uh, times the inner product of f times dot comma 1 plus epsilon f. So basically what is happening here, you trade off two copies of E1 half against one copy of E at 1. OK, I will explain this step later. Let's believe it for the moment. Now we can use Rankin-Selberg again. Um, so this is an L function. So this gives k to the little o of 1, l infinity at 1 divided by l infinity at 1 half squared times l infinity at 1 plus epsilon. And again, I have to uh, estimate a residue here. So for step 5, is the same as step 2. We need Rankine-Selberg and an upper bound for the residue. <coughs> 
Okay, and that's it. Now we only have to collect these gamma factors. And you see precisely what happens. You get a half power of k for one against a half, and then you get another half power for one against a half, and you end up with k to the one plus epsilon. So this is state's formula in the GL2 case that gives a precise description of these gamma factors. So in this case, it's just gamma of k times gamma of k plus epsilon divided by gamma of uh, k minus a half times gamma k minus a half, and this gives twice a half power of k. Okay, so as you can see, we did basically nothing. I mean, uh, we never looked at Fourier coefficients. Um, we, it's, a, it's a very soft argument. We didn't do anything. The only not completely trivial step is this step here, and um, I'm going to explain this. Uh, okay. So concerning four, um, so f e at one half square is by definition the integral over a fundamental domain of h mod gamma of f squared times e squared. And here I estimate, so here I pick a special fundamental domain, namely I pick the usual Siegel set. Um, so I mean, I, I'm only interested in upper bounds, but it, it doesn't really matter. So, so I take a fundamental domain with sufficiently large y coordinate. So f is either this or even the corresponding Siegel set. And then I can simply use the Fourier expansion to bound this by y to the 1 half plus epsilon squared. Right? So the, the constant term in the Fourier expansion is dominating. Everything else is rapidly decaying. And now you see how you trade off two versions of 1 half against one version of 1. Um, so this is y to the 1 plus epsilon, or 1 plus 2 epsilon, and this in turn is bounded above from the Eisenstein series at 1 plus epsilon. Again, by the Fourier expansion, you just, so this is the identity term, and you just add the others artificially and get an upper bound. So this is bounded by integral over f, f of z squared, e of z, 1 plus epsilon, because this contains as a constant term y to the 1 plus epsilon, and then it, it, by positivity, the, the, the other terms for a real argument are all non-negative, so you can artificially add them if you want. And this is precisely what I claimed. Okay, so Philippe told me that this argument also plays a role in his, his paper with Akshay. Um, yeah, so in any case, this is how you regularize this uh, this Eisenstein series at one half. Okay, so that's all, and that's that's com that that completes the proof. Okay, so now this was the warm up, the n equals two case, and um, well, let's do the same thing for GLN. So now the same on GLN, and we have some good chances to to succeed because, as I said, we basically we did nothing. I mean, we used Rankin-Selberg, 
we used state's formula, we used Parseval. Okay, and we have to do something about this regularization. Of course, we do it here for mass forms. There are no holomorphic forms. Um, so let's do the same on GLN for mass forms. Okay, so here's the theorem. Can I just ask a real quick question? Yes. Is it really enough to know an upper bound for the residue, or do you need a bound for uniformly in a neighborhood? Uh, I need it uniformly in a neighborhood. That's true, because here I'm evaluating it at 1 plus epsilon. Um, okay, fine. Um, so, well, whatever, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, certainly if you can bound the residue, then you can also bound it an epsilon away. Okay, theorem. Let f comma g be, for simplicity, tempered. So, assuming, so, uh, satisfying the Ramanujan conjecture, tempered spherical mass forms for the group SLNZ with respective spectral parameters nu and mu. Okay, now I'm not consistent with what I said earlier. In one of the previous lectures, I said that my unitary axis is the real axis. Now it's the imaginary axis. But I think you can cope with this. Um, so they are purely imaginary, by which I mean that they satisfy the Ramanujan conjecture. Okay, then, if, so, uh, G, oh, uh, let's see. Um, okay, so G is fixed, no, wait, I'm, F is fixed, and I'm summing over G. Um, so I'm summing over spectral parameters mu that are in an O of one neighborhood of the given spectral parameter nu. That is the same as sort of taking the same weight. And if you take the same weight, then your spectral parameter is also in an O of one neighborhood. I mean, it's on the nose the same thing, but the next one is, is O of one, has a distance O of one. So I, I, mu and nu are at a distance O of one. L one half F times G squared. And I claim that, I, that the bound is the cardinality of this set. So what's the cardinality of this set? Well, that's the spectral density at nu. And uh, this is measured by the Harish Chandra C function. So this is the density at nu. And I have to be a bit careful. If I'm very close to the walls, then the measure can do something funny. So let me write C tilde. And uh, by this I mean, so by definition, this is the product. Let's see. Um, but this will always be the measure of a one ball, whether or not it's near the wall, right? Yes, yes. Uh, product uh, 1 less than j less than k less than n, 1 plus uh, nu j minus nu k. So the measure itself may behave very strangely if, say, one of two of, so there is a pair of parameters that's equal, um, so I have to adjust this a bit by adding one plus here. Um, yeah, but anyway. Um, uh, to the one plus epsilon. So I, I lose an epsilon on the way. OK, but in spirit, it's the same theorem. You're averaging Rankine-Selberg L functions by taking a fixed form of very large spectral parameter, and then you average over an O of one ball, and the cardinality, so the, the, the upper bound is the cardinality of the set, essentially. 
Okay, how do we prove this? Well, we prove it in the exact same fashion. Let's see if we have all the ingredients available. Okay, so Rankine-Selberg is available. Um, we need an upper bound for the L function at one and in a neighborhood of one and for the residue. Sorry, say this again? So what do we require the margin conjecture in this case when you don't have to for GL2? Oh, uh, probably I don't need it. Um, uh, I think it was just laziness because if, if, uh, if the Ramanujan conjecture is not satisfied, then maybe you have to modify it. Uh, you have to figure out what exactly state's formula says. Do you, do you conjugate or do you take the negative inverse? Or, so, but in, it's, certainly, it's not necessary. Uh, it's just convenient so that you don't have to bother about exceptional eigenvalues. Okay, so as I said, we need an upper bound, and that's in the literature. For Ls f times g. S close to one for n up to four. This was proved proved by Farrell Bramley, and then for general n by uh, Janan Lee, who is probably in the audience. Okay, um, what else do we need? So this is available. Parseval is always available, same as two. Then we need state's formula. Okay. So state's formula tells us. So the end game will be that we need to estimate l infinity, whatever it is, at one squared divided by l infinity of one half. And state's formula tells us what this is in terms of a gamma ratio, and we just have to verify that it coincides with the spectral density. And that's what it does. So this is of the order of magnitude of 1 over c tilde mu squared. OK, so what remains is step four. We need to do a similar trick for general Eisenstein series in order to make this transition from 1 half to 1. OK, well, that's a little lemma. OK, so remember up there, the important thing was to bound the Eisenstein series in a fundamental domain by basically the first Fourier coefficient. And we do the exact same thing here, too. E of z 1 half is bounded by determinant of z to the 1 half plus epsilon, plus there is a dual term, determinant of z tilde to the 1 half plus epsilon, where z tilde is w, z minus transpose, w, and w is the long vial element. And then what you do is you bring this back into canonical Iwasawa decomposition and take the determinant. So in canonical form, And then z has to be in a suitable Siegel set. I can't be too close to the bottom uh, of the upper half space. So z is in a Siegel domain that is 
some x, y, and h such that, say, the x, i, j's are bounded and the y, j's are all not too small. The constant square, square root of 3 over 2 plays no role, but it's a valid constant. OK, and assuming that this lemma is true, we get as a corollary that the integral over the fundamental domain, which, contain, which is contained in S, f of z squared times e of z 1 half squared d mu of z. We get two terms, and then we, in the second term, we make a change of variables to get back to z. And the price we have to pay is that we get z tilde for the, for the cusp form. So this is bounded by integral f z squared plus f z tilde. But this is just a dual mass form. determinant of z to the 1 plus epsilon. And then you can run the same argument with the form itself and with the dual form, and you get the same result. OK, so let me sketch the proof of this lemma. This is uh, not very exciting. Um, it's essentially the same idea. We use the Fourier expansion of this uh, degenerate Eisenstein series, but we use a special form of the Fourier expansion. So first, we write. So one of the main features of this maximal degenerate Eisenstein series is the fact that it's really an Epstein zeta function. Um, so if you slightly renormalize things, determinant of z to the power s divided by zeta of ns times as an Epstein zeta function, x transposed y transposed yx, where xy is z, at the point ns over 2, where z of a matrix m and a complex number rho is the usual Epstein zeta function, 1 half times sum over all non-zero vectors, 1 over the corresponding quadratic form, a transposed ma to the power rho. So you have the values of the quadratic form. If m is positive definite, but this guy here is certainly positive definite. OK, and this is a classical object, this uh, Epstein zeta function. So. OK, and so the Fourier expansion of this Epstein zeta function can be found in the literature. compute inductively the Fourier expansion from an old paper of Audrey Terrace. If a matrix S is given in the following form, identity, identity, Q transpose times T. So I'm following her notation. This is now a matrix S2. And then I, Q, I. And this is an N1 block, and this is an N2 block. So this has N1 rows, and this has N2 rows. And in total, we have N1 plus N2 rows. 
So then gamma r of two rho uh, z of s rho can be written in terms of the Epstein zeta function associated with the smaller matrix S2. And then you can inductively move on. So this is gamma rho, gamma r of 2 rho, z S2 rho, and this is a smaller matrix, plus a matrix, uh, an Epstein zeta function for T, gamma r. 2 rho minus n2 divided by a determinant of s2 square root zt of 2 rho minus n2. And then a complicated term it, that um, takes care of the cross products. I mean, this is a diagonal term, this is a diagonal term, and then we need a term for the cross products. Uh, but this is rapidly decaying because now comes the Fourier expansion in terms of Bessel k functions, and the Bessel k function decays rapidly, so it will not contribute too much. So there is a sum over a and b, a and z to the n1, non zero, and b in z to the n2, non zero, a transposed ta. 1 quarter n2 minus 1 half rho. And then this is a bit technical. B transposed S2 inverse B, 1 half rho minus a quarter n2, times E B transposed QA. So here you see the cross term. Bessel K, 1 half n2 minus rho. 2 pi square root of A transposed TA, B transposed S2 inverse B, and that's it. OK, and then it's an exercise to bound this. So you do this inductively, um, reducing the dimension step by step. And this can be estimated trivially using the rapid decay of the Bessel K function. And uh, then you continue with S2, which has one dimension less. You apply the same argument. And you keep doing this. Uh, and then eventually, you end up. So let me continue here on this blackboard. So eventually, you end up with a sum j from 1 to n, some easy terms that may contribute some poles, but otherwise they are easy. And then z1 up to zj to the minus 1 half, zj to the j over 2 minus rho, uniformly in matrices S of the form x transposed zx, where capital Z is a diagonal matrix Zn up to Z1, and they are ordered such that Zn is the biggest, and Z1 is the smallest, and none of them is really small. OK, and if you plug this in, so this is the bound for the Epstein zeta function based on the Fourier expansion. If you plug this into the above formula, then you get a bound for the Eisenstein series. And if you combine everything, then you get the lemma. So this requires a bit of a case-by-case -case analysis, but the idea is fairly straightforward. OK, um, so this proves the result. And the moral of the story is that uh, in higher rank, it's often useful to use soft techniques and not to try to uh, use things like approximate functional equations. And then you end up with a total mess that you cannot handle. These soft techniques uh, generalize more easily. OK. Well, I guess that's the end of what I would like to teach. I hope you enjoyed this a bit, and nobody will be too angry if I end 10 minutes early. Uh, but maybe you have questions. Well, first, let's thank Vanatou. Any questions?
Uh, yes. Uh, how far are you from the uh, synthetic formula in this? Ah, good questions. Good question. Um, and I should also, I mean, I, I said that these soft techniques um, are more easily generalizable, but at the same time, of course, they are not strong enough to prove something really deep, like subconvexity. They do give something highly non-trivial, nam namely a best possible moment estimate, but it's not strong enough to prove subconvexity, which is morally equivalent to an asymptotic formula with power saving error term. Well, we can, we can look at this proof and see where we fail. Um, and I mean, basically we fail almost everywhere uh, to, get <laughs> to get an asymptotic formula. Um, so the, the first small cheat is here, then the second cheat is when we apply Bessel's uh, inequality um, because there is more than just, so I mean this is a, uh, this is over the whole space of automorphic forms including mass forms of weight k. So th these holomorphic forms of weight k are of course the big chunk that contributes but there are also mass forms of weight k that also contribute. So here is an inequality and then again we have the uh, small fluctuation in the residue um, I, on scrap paper, I worked out a version where I replace k to the epsilon by a log power. Um, but I don't know how to make this into an asymptotic formula, let alone any error term. Okay. Other question? So, is there any chance that this will work if you have this GL3 and then G is like GL2 forms? Oh, um, well, uh, potentially yes, but that's a totally different story. Um, of course, you also have Rankine Selberg. So I said perhaps a bit uh, sloppily that so this this is Rankine Selberg. This is one version of Rankine Selberg, namely GLN times GLN. You can do Rankine Selberg in all possible combinations, GLN times GLM, and you're asking for GLN times GLN minus one. And this is then is of course a totally different story because. Uh, the period for, there is a period formula, but it's a, it's a very different period formula. And it will involve a summation over the lower dimensional GLN minus one spectrum. Um, there is very beautiful work by Matthew Young in this direction. He, um, he uh, computed several moments for GL3 times GL2. Okay. Any more